In this chapter, we're going to discuss numerical integration. The outline of the chapter will be to go through a brief introduction to numerical integration, then talk about various methods including the rectangle method, the trapezoidal rule, Simpson's rule, Romberg's method, and Gauss quadrature. So let's go through a brief introduction to integration. Integrals arise naturally in the fields of engineering to describe quantities that are functions of infinitesimal data. For example, if the velocity of a moving object for a particular period of time is known, then the change of position of the moving object can be estimated by summing the velocity at discrete time points multiplied by the corresponding time intervals between the discrete points. The accuracy of the change in position can be increased by decreasing the number of discrete time points, that is, by reducing the time intervals between the discrete points. The formal definition of an integral of a function, where the function can be denoted f between a and b, is the signed area of the region under the curve f of x between the points a and b. So the definite integral is denoted by the symbol shown here, where this is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. The fundamental theorem of calculus links the concepts of integration and differentiation. Roughly speaking, they are the converse of each other. The fundamental theorem of calculus can be stated in two parts. So for part one, we let f between a and b be a continuous function, and let big F between a and b be the function defined such that for every x between a and b, f of, big F of x is equal to the integral from a to x of f of x dx. Then big F is uniformly continuous on the closed interval from a to b, it is differentiable on the open interval from a to b, and f is the derivative of big F, which can also be stated that big F is the antiderivative of little f, which means that df by dx is equal to little f of x. So in other words, the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus asserts that if our function little f is continuous on the interval, the closed interval from a to b, then an antiderivative big F always exists. And little f is the derivative of a function big F that can be defined as shown here, or denoted big F of x is equal to the integral from a to x of little f of x dx, where x is, between, is within the closed interval uh, from a to b. Now for part two, we again have f, or little f, in the closed interval from a to b, and big F in the closed interval from a to b are two continuous functions such that little f of x is equal to d big F by dx. So this just states that little f is the derivative of big F, or big F is the antiderivative of little f. Then we can say that the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to big F of b minus big F of a. So basically the second part states that if little f has an antiderivative big F, then big F can be used to calculate the definite integral of little f on the interval from a to b. So one of the early definitions of the integral of a function is known as the Riemann integral, and it is the limit defined here. So the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the limit of the maximum of delta as delta k goes to zero of the sum of k goes from one to n of f of x k star times delta x k. And we're going to just um, denote this equation as star for now, just so we can refer to it later. So here, um, all of our points x1, x2, x3, up to xn plus 1 are between a and b, where a is equal to x1 and b is equal to xn plus 1. Delta x is just the difference between, or delta xk is just the difference between xk plus 1 and xk. And xk star is an arbitrary point such that xk star is within the interval from xk to xk plus 1. So basically what this means is that if a is the sum of the areas of vertical rectangles arranged next to each other, 
whose top sides touch the function f at arbitrary points, then the Riemann integral is the limit of this sum a as the maximum width of the vertical rectangles approaches zero. And this can be visualized here. So these rectangles um, touch the function at arbitrary points, um, and as the width of the rectangles decreases, so as the at the limit, um, the area under that the area of all of the rectangles approaches the integral of the function. And it's also important to note that um, the division does not have to be regular. So the regular the um, rectangles don't all have to be the same size. So this still provides uh, the same um, or a valid estimate of the integral as shown on the right hand side here. So a function is called Riemann integ integrable if the limit described in the um, expression that we called star, which is basically the limit of a, if that limit exists as the width of the rectangles gets smaller and smaller. So in this course, we're always dealing with continuous functions, and for continuous functions, the limit always exists, and thus all continuous functions are Riemann integrable. Another important concept to talk about is the Newton-Coates formulas. So the Newton-Coates formulas rely on replacing the function or tabulated data with an interpolating polynomial that is easy to integrate. In this case, the required integral is evaluated as shown here. So the integral is equal to the integral from, f of, uh, from a to b of f of x dx, which is approximately equal to the integral from a to b of fn of x, where fn of x is a polynomial of degree n that be con can be constructed to pass through n plus 1 data points on the interval from a to b. So let's look at an example of the Newton-Coates formulation. So consider the function f defined as shown here on the interval from 0 to 1. And we want to calculate the exact integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. Then we want to use different step sizes, where h is uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 1, to fit an interpolating polynomial to the values of the function at the generated points and calculate the integral by integrating the polynomial. Then we will compare the exact uh, answer with the interpolating polynomial. So the exact integral can be calculated um, can be calculated by hand. So if this is our function, the integral is, um, this is the antiderivative, so 2x minus x cubed over 3 plus 0 0.1 times 0 0.7 over 2 pi sine 2 pi x over 0.7, evaluated between 0 and 1. So we just plug in our limits, um, where this is evaluating at 1, and this is evaluating at 0, and we can calculate this out, and we see that i exact is equal to 1.6715. So we can write a function in MATLAB to do the polynomial interpolation and calculate the integral based on that. So this is just a, a snippet of the uh, MATLAB script. So here we're just defining the function f between our limits a and b. Um, the, the, exact, the command to calculate the exact integral, which is of course done numerically in MATLAB, um, but it's pretty close to the exact integral, is the function called integral. Um, and then this is just for setting up uh, the plot. So for our approximation, we want to define our step size h, and then we want to um, set up our vector x between a and b with a step size of h, and then y is just going to evaluate um, the function at all of those values of x. Then we need to fit, uh, find the coefficients of an interpolating polynomial. So that's what this line does here. We can use the function polyfit with inputting our x and our y, um, and then this is the order of the polynomial, which is going to be if I have n plus 1 data points, I can fit a polynomial of order n, so it's the length of x minus 1. So that gives me my interpolating polynomial, and then I calculate the, the integral um, by integrating the polynomial. So um, first thing I want to do is find 
the value, the y value of the polynomial at, um, this is for plotting, and then this q is equal to poly int coefs, basically calculates the integral um, of the polynomial defined by my coefficients. And then i1 here using diff evaluates um, basically the difference between two different uh, b between adjacent points in the vector that you put into it. So basically I'm evaluating my polynomial defined in Q, which is the integral of the polynomial defined by coefficients, um, and then uh, evaluating that at the, the two at the limits, so A and B, and then diff just takes the difference of that, because basically our integral is equal to, remember, F of b minus f of a. So that's what this um, function is doing. So we can do this for each of the values of h and um, take a look at the results. So this is showing the results for h is equal to 1. So we recall our exact integral shown here. Um, so this shows the plot. So when h is equal to 1, we basically just have one uh, subinterval. And so our interpolating polynomial it just goes between those two points, so it's a linear function um, shown by the orange line. So then we take the integral of that and evaluate that at the limits, and so the approximate integral when h is equal to 1 is 1.50495, 1 and the polynomial that, um, the interpolating polynomial was defined as shown here as 2.1 minus 1.1901x. Now, if we increase the step size, h is equal, or decrease the step size, h is equal to 0 0.5. Now we have um, three points that our polynomial is going to go through, so we can define a polynomial of um, degree 2. So the, the co coefficients are, are shown here, um, and then when we integrate that, the approximation of our integral is 1.65348. And again, compare that to our exact 1.6715. And um, just based on these coefficients, this is what the interpolating polynomial was in this case. We can decrease our step size again, so this is h is equal to 0 0.2. Um, and here we have our approximation is 1.67294, so getting quite close to the actual uh, integral. And here the interpolating polynomial was defined up to here, it was a fifth order polynomial for the um, data points defined by the h. And then lastly, our h is equal to 0 0.1. Um, you can see the data points shown here, and you can see that the uh, approximation of our integral is the same as our exact integral up to these four decimal places. And um, this is the uh, interpolating polynomial that was defined in this case. Now, there are some disadvantages um, which kind of stem from what we talked about in chapter 7 uh, with the interpolating polynomials. So basically, the larger the degree polynomial, the more susceptible it is to oscillations. So in this previous example, when we added more, turn, or more uh, data points, our approximation got better, but because of the behavior of the function, um, we didn't see a lot of oscillations. But again, if we look at um, the Runge function, which we've used previously, defined on the interval from minus 1 to 1, we will see that we can uh, run into this issue with a large oscillations. So this shows... Um, using the Runge function for uh, exactly the same problem as the previous example. So here using h is equal to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and, 0, and uh, h is equal to 1. And you see the um, exact integral is 0 0.5494, as well as you can see the different approximations with our different values of h. So you can see that um, Using many points leads to large oscillations in the interpolating polynomial, particularly out in the in the edges here, uh, which renders the numerical integration largely inaccurate. So you can see that this is not a very good approximation of our exact integral. Um, you can also see that when fewer points are used, the polynomial uh, interpolating polynomial is still highly inaccurate. Um, so looking at you know h is equal to 0 0.5, we're still not getting a great um, it's better, but it's not. It's still not a great approximation, and h is equal to 1 is um, also quite inaccurate. So the Newton's Coates formulas can then be, in, instead of applying them 
across the entire function, they can be applied by simply subdividing the interval into smaller subintervals and applying these formulas to each subinterval and adding up the results. So this process is called composite rules and the rectangle method, trapezoidal rule, and Simpson's rules that we will talk about in the next few sections are specific examples of the composite Newton-Coates formulas.